All right, let's uh, go ahead and get started. Let me pray for us today. Father, thank you for Bryan College. Thank you for allowing us time to study your word. Um, I pray that you help us come to your word with humility. Um, I pray you give us a desire to be under your word, not over your word. Um, I pray that the teaching of your word would be the means of grace to conform us to the image of our creator. I pray that the end result of all of this would be that we would love you we love you enough to obey your commands and to do what you say and to turn from self-rule to God's rule. Father, help us see uh, today by your spirit the glories of the Lord Jesus. For we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, we're on uh, discussion 16. A um, few more of these and we'll be halfway finished with the semester. That's kind of hard to uh, believe, but uh, that's how far we've been able to go in the midst of this COVID crisis. As always, please remember to take attendance quiz uh, 16. What we're going to look at today are three things. One is we're going to try to get into this story of Judas and Jesus. Uh, what's, uh, what's going on with that uh, story? Um, why is it that Judas is singled out? Um, how does it relate to this whole idea of election? Um, I chose you, yet one of you is a devil. Jesus said that. Um, how does election and predestination, how does that relate to human responsibility? We're going to look a little at that today. And we're going to talk about uh, Jesus and the unity of God. So th these are the three things we're going to uh, look at. So let's dive in. Now, I want to give you some information that you may or may not know in the story. And you tell me if this helps you at all. So here's the word Judas. And I just came to my computer program and I typed in the word Judas. And the very first reference that the computer pulled out is this in the Greek text, uh, Judas. So you can see it's virtually spelled exactly uh, the same way it is in English, a little difference with the diphthong there, uh, but it's the same word, eudos. However, if I come to the computer and I say, find every place in the text where this word appears. And if I do the same search in Greek, this is what comes up. What do you notice about this word, the Greek form of this word, in terms of its relation in the Bible? Well, can you see that the word Judas and the word Judah are exactly the same word. In fact, um, you know, the, the New Testament will uh, translate the word Judah sometimes as the word Jude, uh, sometimes as the word Judas, but never in English does it translate that word as Judah, but it actually should because that's the word that appears. The word Judas 
and the word Judah are exactly the same word in Greek. And you might say, well, so what? Uh, why, why should I care uh, that the word uh, Judas and the word uh, Judah are the same? How is that going to help me in the story? Well, I want you to start thinking about the story of Judas, or rather Judah, and Joseph. Are there any comparisons in the story or contrast in the story between Judah and Joseph? Remember, Joseph is stripped naked. He's thrown into a pit. Uh, he's sold for money. And then out of that, somehow God orchestrates the redemption of Israel. I want you to think about the contrast between the Judas story and the Joseph story. And these appear in the uh, Old Testament. Um, I think it's uh, Genesis 37 and 38. Um, but those stories, the Joseph story, I think this is the way it works. Uh, I think it goes... Uh, 37 and 38, you have Joseph introduced, and then in 30, um, sorry, 39, in 38, you have this story of Judah and Tamar. And when you're reading those two stories, Moses wants us to understand there's a contrast between the purity of the life of Joseph and the utter debauchery of Judah. And I want to tell that story as quickly as I can, summarizing uh, chapter 38. Here's the story. Uh, First of all, uh, Judah marries a Canaanite. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing in this story? Is it okay to intermarry with Canaanites in the Old Testament? Or were the Canaanites like God's uh, picture of the bad people? Clearly, uh, that's how they function in the story. They're part of what's called the Canaanite curse. They're the... Um, ones to be wiped out when Israel goes in and takes the promised land. But Judah, instead of uh, marrying uh, a woman who believes in Jesus, uh, believes in God, um, he instead goes outside and marries a Canaanite. Uh, her name is uh, Bathsheba. And... Um, he marries her. At first, it doesn't even say that he married her. It says he uh, saw daughter of the Canaanite. That This is exactly this language of Genesis 6, where the sons of God saw the daughters of men. And it says he took her and he went into her. Um, honestly, I can't tell you uh, from the Hebrew whether that's implying that he raped her or whether they just fell into this uh, torrid uh, fair, it seems to me that the language would allow either one of those um, uh, ideas. But he marries this Canaanite woman, which is strictly forbidden in, um, in the Bible. And they have three children. 
And those three children are so wicked that God kills two of them. Uh, now, there are a lot of wicked people in the Bible that, do, that God doesn't kill. The fact that they're having children and it says uh, these children did what was raw in God's eyes, what was evil, what was wicked, and God killed him. Uh, this family was uh, an utterly debauched family in the story. And because the two boys uh, died and uh, Judah knew a little bit about God's law, the law, the future law that would be revealed by Moses. He knows the whole thing about leveret marriage. And so uh, he had married his sons to a Canaanite woman named Tamar. And uh, the word Tamar in Hebrew means something like date palm. And uh, I'm told that that's some kind of very sweet uh, fruit. And so I guess her name in Hebrew would be something like Sweetie. And so he's giving this girl uh, to his boys and God's killing the boys because they're wicked. But he thinks that what's wrong is this woman Tamar. And so even though his youngest son should have Tamar under this leveret marriage law that we hear about later, Judah won't give her to him. And so Judah concocts a plan. And that is, uh, she hears that her father-in-law, uh, Judah, is going to uh, shear sheep with a friend of his who's a Canaanite, Hiram the Adulamite. And she dresses herself up as a prostitute and she goes, sits by the way. And here comes Judah. And Judah's wife is dead. And uh, I guess the text says that he's lonely and uh, has needs. And so he asks Tamar, not knowing that she's his very own daughter-in-law, but asks Tamar if he can uh, sleep with her. And she says, well, what will you give me? And he says, I'll give you a goat. I'm not sure what I think about that. Uh, I'm not sure how valuable a goat was, but he, he agrees and says, well, I don't have a goat with me. And she says, well, if you give me your ring, your belt, your wallet, uh, send the goat and then I'll give these back. And so uh, they strike the deal and the deal goes down. The text says that she conceived a child as a result of that encounter, by the way. The text is very interesting when Judah comes to pay the debt because his friend Hera, the Adulamite, doesn't just work, use the word prostitute. He uses a very technical term in Hebrew, cult prostitute. So the story is not telling us, oh, this is like pretty woman or something like that. She's not dressed up as a run-of-the-mill prostitute. She's dressed up as a Canaanite fertility cult prostitute. Uh, the practices of which uh, boggle the imagination in terms of wickedness. And so Judah not only slept with a prostitute, but he slept with what he thought was a Canaanite fertility cult prostitute, a cult prostitute. Three months later, when it's told him that Tamar is pregnant, uh, and in Hebrew it says uh, uh, something like uh, Tamar has whored a whoredom and has conceived out of her whoredom uh, a child and Judah says, well, if, if, she's, if she's that kind of woman, we got to kill her. And stoning won't do. I know that's what you're supposed to do with sexually immoral people. We've got to make her a public example 
we've got to burn her alive because that's what the high priest happens to the high priest's daughter if she commits adultery. And so they're dragging her out, about to burn her alive. And she says, I have three things here if you want to know who the father of this child is. And they say, show it. And it says, well, it's a ring, a belt, and a wallet. And Judah says, well, she's more righteous than I am. And it says he uh, left her alone uh, after that. She bore two children. So if you contrast, and let, let me just ask the question. If you are contrasting the life of Judah and the life of Joseph, in your mind, which one would be the hero of this story? <laughs> I'm going to pick this guy all day long, right? Uh, he's righteous. He resists this woman who plagues the daylights out of him to sleep with him. He says, I, I can't sin against God. I can't sin against my master by sleeping with you. He says, no, 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 no continually know versus Judah who is just completely debauched in life. And then you're left in the story with this huge question. Who should get the firstborn blessing from God? Joseph is the first child of the wife um, that Jacob loved. In fact, if Leah hadn't pretended to be her sister, Reuben's not born, Simeon's not born, Levi's not born, Judah's not born. If, if, if they had lived pure lives, this would be the firstborn. But somehow in the story, the person who gets the firstborn blessings is a man who may have raped a Canaanite. At least, I mean, if you put the best spin on the story, he married her. I'm really not sure in Hebrew which way you're supposed to read that. But all the offspring of Judah are the half Canaanite uh, offspring of a man who slept with his own daughter-in-law. You're kind of left in the story. How do we think about righteous Joseph whose righteous life benefits Judah but Judah is the one who gets the blessing and Joseph doesn't. Are you interested in the story? Do, do you feel the tension in that story now? How are Judas and Judah like or unlike each other? I meant to have these fly in uh, one at a t time. I must have messed something up. But uh, have you ever read this in the Judah story? Judah said to his brothers, his brothers said, let's kill Joseph. The more righteous he is, the more his brothers hated him. So eventually they said, let's, uh, let's kill him. And, and it's Judah, Judah, who says, what prophet is there if we kill our brother and conceive his brother, in other words, I know Cain killed Abel, but you know, instead of just killing him, let's let's make a little money off of him. And 
because Joseph was 17 years old when this happened, there's actually a, a table in Leviticus that talks about if someone's accidentally killed, um, or, or sorry, if someone makes a vow, there's a table of the money that you have to reimburse if you make a vow, depending on how old you are. And that table in Leviticus 27.5 says if a person is five years old up to 20 years old, so that's Joseph would be in that category, five years to 20 years old, then the valuation for that male will be 20 shekels. And we know from the New Testament that a shekel is two denarii, and a denarius is a hundred dollars, so 20 shekels in our money is about four thousand dollars. Just a random law. Uh, if you make a vow uh, and it involves your person, then uh, it's four thousand dollars. You're going to have to pay with that vow. And then some people continue reading and they read this sentence and the value for a female who is 5 to 20 years old is $2,000. And I can hear Richard Dawkins now. The Bible is the most anti-woman uh, what, what is it? He says a misogynistic, uh, uh, homophobic, racist, infanticide, pestilential, megalomaniacal bully. Isn't that what he calls God in the Old Testament? Well, I'm going to say to Dawkins, just hold your horses there a minute. It may not be any such thing. Because when we ask this question, how is Judas like Judah, does anybody sell Jesus for money? Anybody exchange money for the person of Jesus? And they do. And the value is 30 pieces of silver, or if we use the Old Testament, 30 um uh, 30 shekels. So that's about $6,000. When they come to the high priest, they offer uh, $6,000 for Jesus. Well, that's really weird because when we come to this same table, exact table where this number comes from, it says the valuation of a male 20 years old to 60 years old will be 50 shekels. In other words, what's the going rate for a man 20 years old uh, to um, 50 years old, and it's $10,000. But the high priests don't offer $10,000 for Jesus. They offer $6,000. which is the price of a woman or the price of a slave. You see, the high priest meant the price of 30 pieces of silver to be an insult. They were saying, we don't know if Jesus is really a man or not. We won't give you the price of a full man for Jesus. We'll give you the price of a woman or the price of a slave. And God, in his meta-narrative elegance, says, 
30 pieces of silver is the price of a woman. But it's a glorious woman. It's a woman who one day will be the impress of the universe, who will co-rule and co-reign. A woman who, as the new Eve, has been enslaved and by my death, I will buy her back. I will set her free. If the sovereign God of the universe who holds the molecules of the universe together was willing to incarnate forever and then suffer crucifixion to buy back a woman who was sold to slavery, if, if that's somehow hating women, I, I don't see it. That seems like it's putting women, uh, putting woman, a woman is the glorious cast character in the meta narrative. And Dawkins is right if you're so foolish that when you read a book and you open and you read one sentence and then you shut the book and say, oh, that book is the stupidest thing I've ever seen because you've read one sentence. I would say to someone like that, you're reading the book as a child. I would expect more from an Oxford professor. I would expect someone who read the end from the beginning and asked the question of the meta narrative and began to look at the details because if you do that, it's clear when Judas is selling Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, it isn't just telling us about money. It's telling us about the meta narrative and what a glorious meta narrative. Uh, it is. We want to look uh, a little bit about Jesus and the unity of God. Um, I did not mean for my lecture to run so long on the first part, but uh, um, what we want to look at is something that occurs in John 17. John 17 makes the statement that God the Father gave his name to Jesus. Uh, in a minute, I'm going to pull up that slide where it says it. The place where this is fully explained is in Philippians 2. And so we want to look at both these passages. Uh, they're both connected. And they're both connected to this verse. By myself I've sworn, from my mouth has gone out Righteousness, a word that shall not return to me, every knee will bow and every tongue swear allegiance. Now, this is what John 17 says. Uh, this, this is part of this conversation uh, recorded in chapter 13 through 17. It's a conversation that John has included word for word. He's the only one who tells us the conversation, and it's from the end of the Lord's Supper which is recorded by the other evangelists until they get to the garden. Nobody else tells us what was going on there. John tells us, and he gives it to us word for word. It's five chapters long. This is the end of that conversation, and Jesus is in prayer, and he says, he lifted his eyes up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. We're going to look at that if we have time. Um, this, this idea that there's a group uh, that's been given Jesus by God. Jesus says this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and you and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. What is eternal life? Eternal life is knowing the true God and Jesus Christ. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work you gave me to do. Now And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the cosmos existed. 
That's what uh, word appears in Greek. And then Jesus says, I have manifested your name, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words you gave me, and they have received them and come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the cosmos, but I am praying for those you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine, and I'm glorified in them. I'm no longer in the world. They are in the world. I'm coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name. Keep them in your name. Your name, which you have given me. This text in two places is saying that God the Father has given his name to Jesus. I pray that they would be one even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, your name, the name which you have given me. I have guarded them. Not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, as the scripture may be fulfilled. John 17 says that God's name has been given to Jesus. Now, if we want the clearest uh, statement of that, this is where we would go in the New Testament. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name, the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What does this text mean? Well, if we go to scholars, uh, one very good scholar is a man named uh, Maximilian Zerwick, and he writes of this phrase in Greek, the name, the one above every name, i.e. his own name, i.e. the Lord or Yahweh in the Old Testament. Therefore, God hyper exalted him and gave him the name, the one above every name. Now, some people are going to come to that and say, wait, wait a second, uh, it's Lord, not capital L-O-R-D, and doesn't this term hyper-exalted imply that he was raised to a higher position than he held previously? After all, that's what the word hyper means. Well, this is how the word's used in the Old Testament. For you, O Lord, and I don't know why it isn't doing it this way, because this is the word, and you tell me, is, is that the tetragrammaton or not? It looks like the tetragrammaton to me. Therefore, you, O Lord, are the Most High. You are exalted above all gods. You are hyper-exalted above all the gods. That's how the word's used. Or if we go here in Daniel, blessed are you, O Lord, uh, God of our ancestors, to be praised and highly exalted forever. Blessed is your glorious and holy name to be highly praised and huper upsaod into the forever of the forevers. And here, uh, behold, now I praise and extol, I praise and I huper upsao, and I glorify the King of Heaven. 
So it's clear when Paul says God hyper exalted him, it is not carrying with that any iota of the sense that he was raised to somewhere that he was not before. And if we look at how the phrase ta anima ta huper, this same phrase is used everywhere. And in every single one of these passages, it's always this person who's being spoken of. So when the text says that Jesus is given the name which is above every name, it's saying Jesus is given the is being given the tetragrammaton. And that's why in the Old Testament, God's covenant name is Yahweh. Uh, some people pronounce it Jehovah. Uh, it's the same word depending on what vowels you put with it. To avoid saying God's name in vain, they replaced it with the word Adonai, which technically means my Lord's plural. And in the uh, Septuagint, they replaced it with the word Kurios. So when Paul says, uh, the name, the name above every other name, he's talking about his own name. He's talking about the Tetragrammaton. And there is kind of a shady scholar, I don't know, I don't know what to think of him, uh, but he did write a book about that very subject that's in our library uh, um, you can check it out for yourself if you want. That's why the New Testament takes passages about Yahweh and applies them to Jesus right, left, and center. The Old Testament says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone who calls on ta anima kuriu will be saved. And of course, that's applied to Jesus in Romans 10, 13. It's applied to Jesus in Acts 2, uh, 21. And you can see that this phrase, ta anima kuriu, you see I've just moved it down there. You don't even have to be able to read Hebrew to recognize that calling on the name of the Lord is calling on YHWH. The New Testament is applying those passages to Jesus. Even monotheistic language can be applied to Jesus. And so that's why in Isaiah 42, you have passages like declare and present your case, let them take counsel together, who told this long ago, who declared it all, was it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God. There is none besides me. Turn to me and be saved, for I am God, and there is no other. And then our very passage, by myself. And who is the myself? The myself is God. I have sworn from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return to me. Every knee will bow and every tongue swear allegiance. Paul is applying this passage to Jesus. And what's really interesting is he applies the same passage to God the Father. How do you take a passage that says, I'll never give my glory to anyone else and apply it to Jesus and God the Father unless your understanding of the one God includes the Father and the Son, the Father and the Son and the Spirit? And if you, want, if you want to say, well, show me that Philippians 2 is quoting that verse. Well, okay, uh, this is Philippians 2. And this is Isaiah 45, 23, all right? What words are the same? 
Well, every knee is the same. Every tongue is the same. Confess is the same. And we didn't underline it, but bow down is the same. These are exactly the same words. They're in slightly different order because Paul's quoting it from memory. But clearly he's taking a passage about the one God, Isaiah 45, 23. And he's saying that includes Jesus. Well, in the 10 minutes we have left, we're going to tackle the easy question of predestination, election, and human responsibility. And this is what we have in John. Jesus in our reading today said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Now, uh, Matthias, I'm not going to put you on the spot here, but uh, you tell me if I'm wrong. This is the word elect, right? Ek lego. And this is exactly where, in English, we get the word elect from, pick out. You did not pick me out, but I picked you out. You did not elect me, I elected you. And I placed you in order that you go, and I placed you in order that you bear much fruit, and I placed you that your fruit would remain. You didn't do that to me. I did that to you. Now, I come to this passage and I hear Jesus say that. And I'm not going to say out loud to Jesus because I know better. But I know what my flesh is saying. And my flesh says, these people chose you, Jesus. You came up to the day on the lake and you said, follow me. And they dropped everything and they chose you. They came. Other people did not come. They came. They chose you. Well, Jesus was there. Jesus knew that. But he's saying to these people, and recall this is after Judas has abandoned him. Jesus is saying, you didn't, you didn't pick me out. I picked you out. And you say, okay, Jesus, well, that's true, then it doesn't matter what I do. And John and Jesus both say, that's not true. It does matter what you do. John is teaching the doctrine of election. We're going to see Peter taught it. Uh, we're going to take a deep dive into uh, Paul, uh, what he taught in both Romans 9 and uh, Ephesians 1 and 2. The New Testament writers weren't afraid of the term predestination. They used the term uh, praorizo. Uh, I remember growing up in a Christian tradition that uh, rejected the, that teaching and I remember people would say, well, I don't believe in predestination. And I said that until I started seeing the word predestination in the Bible. And the term election in the Bible, and I thought, well, I can't just say I don't believe the Bible, so I better figure out what the Bible's talking about when it uses this term to boundary off beforehand or uses this term to pick out, to pick out with incredible interest. Um, what does it mean 
Well, clearly what it doesn't mean and what nobody in the New Testament teaches is that if God does this, it doesn't matter what you do. What John teaches is this. Does he teach election? Well, you tell me. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all you, whom you have given him. You gave people to Jesus and he's going to give them eternal life. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me Helkuos him. Where else does that word? Well, it's what um, Peter does when he takes his sword out. Uh, no one comes to me unless the Father draws him. It's the exact same word when um, Paul is thrown down in the temple and they grab him and drag him out to kill him outside the temple. They hell kuo Paul. And Jesus is saying, no man comes to me unless the Father hell kuos him. And then we get into this prayer, and this seems the most of all, I am praying for them, I am not praying for the world. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world. John 3, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world be saved. There's a real offer to everybody. Whoever believes will not be condemned. Whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed. That sure sounds like there's human responsibility. Nobody's saying, if you're elect, just don't worry about it. You have to believe, you have to respond. But the text is teaching something about those people who have responded. And you come to that and you say, well, I just don't get how those two truths can, can be true. I don't get how God can elect and at the same time, a choice be a real choice. But that's what John is teaching. And remember, that's what he's taught from the very beginning. All who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. If you believed, you got the right. And if you believe, you were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, but the will of men, but you were born of God. And so if you come to this and you say, well, I'm a Calvinist, and this is my verse, and you come to this and you say, well, I'm an Arminian, and this is my verse. And Jesus says, well, I believe in the Bible, and this is my verse. That there's election and human responsibility. And it's in the same verse in John 1, and it's in every page. I mean, this one, which, oh my goodness, Calvinist poster child right here, right? Well, what's 316 say? God so loved the world that whoever, we have a teaching in scripture that is not teaching any kind of hyper-Calvinism 
or fatalism or it doesn't matter what you do, but it's not teaching Pelagianism either, which says that somehow you're untouched by the fall and you have within it everything you need to respond to God. The Bible is teaching something else from that, and we're going to take a deep dive into that. I see my time has run out. I will see you next time.